Hi, and welcome to the program, Migraine 360, it's novel therapies and migraine prevention, a case-based focus on monoclonal antibodies. I'm delighted today to be joined by Stuart Tepper, Professor of Neurology at Dartmouth um, at the School of Medicine there. He's the director of the Dartmouth Headache Center. Um, and I am at the University of uh, Tennessee College of Medicine uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, in the Department of Clinical Psychiatry and Family Medicine. So here are our faculty disclosures. Um, hopefully you will not detect any such bias uh, from commercial or other entities today. It should be fair balanced. Uh, the program information, this is a program that's uh, sponsored by and provided by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education or NACME. That's an HMP global company. And it's supported by an educational grant from Teva Pharmaceutical. Our learning objectives uh, today are to review the pharmacodynamics of novel CGRP, monoclonal antibodies for migraine prevention. Also, we're gonna compare the anti-CGRP therapy monoclonal antibodies to older preventive medications in terms of overall use, uh, in terms of adverse events and our efficacy profile. We're gonna be discussing factors informing patient selection for migraine prophylactic treatment in our program today. So let's talk a little bit about pathophys uh, and how we relate CGRP to what we think we know about migraine pathophysiology. So um, in the old days, we thought that vasodilatation uh, was the be all and end all of migraines. We now know that's not true, that uh, uh, peripheral uh, vasodilatation is, is uh, not necessary, neither is it sufficient uh, to explain all the clinical phenomena that we see uh, with migraine headaches. But it looks like it is. Um, a complex phenomenon that is neuro and vaso uh, effective, and there is um, uh, a neurovascular inflammation that takes place. And um, this looks to be associated with the meningeal vessels uh, that are intimately sensitive to uh, input from the trigeminal ganglia um, and also the superior salivatory uh, nucleus. And so um, there, there are a number of uh, inside the cranium structures and outside the cranium structures that have significant crosstalk that result in neural inflammation. And there's uh, obviously vasogenic uh, inflammation that occurs. And this appears to be um, how migraines take effect and how symptomatology uh, uh, appears in patients. With respect to the periphery and pain mechanisms, what you see is there is vasodilatation associated with many migraineurs and their symptoms. And this results in a neurogenic inflammation. And we could look at uh, different neuropeptides that are involved um, and, and different um, cytokines that are involved. Suffice to say that uh, CGRP and prostaglandins uh, can be um, effective agents in causing vasodilatation of cerebral and meningeal blood vessels and the inflammation of the surrounding tissues. What you see uh, at the bottom right hand corner is sort of a cartoon of this concept of an inflammatory cloud that surrounds uh, a cranial vessel and, and then uh, that vessel becomes vasodilated and that inflammatory milieu um, is uh, thought to contribute to the, the painful um, phenomena that are experienced by patients. Now, this is an incredibly complex cascade. Uh, it, it's a positive feedback loop and it's also associated with uh, what we think about central processing of painful signals um, in migraineurs. Um, and so it's not just simply vasodilatation, as we said, it's not just inflammation. There are other central processing uh, deficits that are involved in patients with migraines. So let's talk a little bit about CGRP, calcitonin gene-related peptide, and how that might be uh, involved. This is a neuropeptide. It belongs to the calcitonin family, um, and there, there are a number of them. And it is involved in second messenger uh, systems. It is widely distributed throughout the areas of the brain that are associated both with uh, migraine pathophys and also general pain, um, general pain perception. It is actually the most potent endogenous vasodilator um, and it's present at all the migraine pathogenesis sites. So if you look at some of the data that highlights sort of the role of CGRP in patients who have migraine, uh, interestingly, if you look at the external jugulars, so sort of the, the final common pathway for draining out of the cranium, uh, CGRP concentrations rise during spontaneous migraine attacks. In patients who have migraines, if you infuse them IV with CGRP, um, then uh, that can trigger an attack. Now, in normal patients who are not previously known to have migraines, uh, elevated CGRP doesn't do it, but in migraineurs, 
CGRP infusion does uh, precipitate headache. After administration of triptans, uh, in the patients who respond, their, their CGRP serum levels decrease, uh, and that's actually exactly in parallel with the symptomatic relief that they get uh, from their migraine symptoms. If you block or remove CGRP, um, then uh, it can terminate the migraine acutely, and it can also prevent migraines. So that's obviously what we're talking about tonight with some of the, um, the agents that can act on CGRP. So it is a treatment target. I, I find this uh, slide to be, to be quite informative because it shows us a, a number of different agents and how they're thought to act in reducing symptomatology. So the triptans and argots prevent CGRP release. We'll see later in the builds on this slide that they also can reduce uh, inflammation. Lesmitidan uh, prevents CGRP release. And so you see that on the sort of presynaptic vesicle in terms of preventing CGRP from getting loose in the synapse to start with. Um, Onobotulinum toxin A also does the same thing. It prevents CGRP release. And so um, in the United States, we use that for chronic migraineurs um, as a treatment strategy. Now, there are um, other agents that are available. Arinumab is um, an anti-CGRP receptor monoclonal antibody. So it sort of binds the receptor um, and, and leads to blockade. There are also ligand monoclonal antibodies. Um, and you see the, the Zumab uh, class or grouping of medications. And there they just sort of grab the, the CGRP moiety uh, and bind it with an antibody. And then there are receptor antagonists. We call this the GPANT class or group of medications. And, and there you see uh, that, it, that it actually um, antagonizes the CGRP receptor. Here's the, uh, the promised uh, sort of closing the slide on the, on the, the, the intracellular signaling where this inflammatory cascade starts, triptans and ergoids can actually uh, constrict the, 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 the vasodilated uh, vessels. And then NSAIDs can also reduce this neurogenic inflammation. We talked about the inflammatory cloud that surrounds the vessel. So let's talk about some of the differences between episodic migraine and chronic migraine. This is a study called the CAMEO study, and it basically shows a sinusoidal um, clinical phenomenology over time of migraineurs. And so you see that there's a lot of uh, leeway, if you will, between the symptoms that patients um, express in terms of monthly headache frequency. Now, the dotted line is 15. That's sort of an arbitrary line for what constitutes chronic migraines. 15 headache days per month uh, is, is uh, just a nosologic definition of chronic migraineurs. And you see that patients rise and fall above that line as they move through time um, in, in sort of a, a back and forth fashion. So these categories are not discrete. They're nosologic, not clinically phenomenologic. What does that mean? It means we made these categories up and sometimes patients refuse to read the textbooks and their brains and their vessels sometimes don't necessarily follow our nosologic categories. So somebody might qualify as a chronic migraine one month and then another month they might have fewer uh, than those uh, uh, headaches by definition that would make them a, a, a CM. Patient. Here's another look at that same sort of data set. If you look at the average annual incidence of new onset chronic migraines, it's about 2.5% in episodic migraine uh, patients. Um, now, this can be exacerbated by medication overuse. There are other risk factors that we'll talk about in a moment that can, uh, can, can cause patients or put them at increased risk of, of going to, to chronic migraine. But also patients come back. Patients who have chronic migraines uh, or for 15 or more days of pain per month, they actually can go into high frequency or low frequency episodic migraines. And we do see that over one year's time in this study, what uh, was, was illustrated is that uh, about six out of 10 patients move back uh, to a less severe category. And over two years, seven out of 10 patients move back to a less severe category. So I see this as very hopeful as a primary care clinician that there might be things that we could do, uh, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic to mitigate risk and to help these patients move back to a less uh, severe headache category. So what are some of the initial predictors for prognosis? If we look at development of chronic migraines, that's the 15 or more headache days per month in population studies, certainly obesity is um, a, a modifiable risk factor. Now, um, demographics such as education, uh, ethnicity, marital status, those might not be modifiable. Um, how about caffeine use, top quartile, that we could get people to sort of cut down on the caffeine and that might uh, help uh, stressful life events. So counseling, 
uh, helping people to, to cope better, that can be helpful. Snoring, people who have a high propensity for obstructive sleep apnea might be uh, at risk, medication overuse, um, some of those things might be modifiable risk factors. You see nicotine use as well. So the most important predictors are uh, frequency of headaches at baseline, the type of acute medication uh, that are used, and uh, the, the, the higher that, that they use it, the greater the likelihood of progression. So failure to remit or failure to move from the right category to the left um, has to do with demographics um, that are unfortunately not that modifiable, but we did talk about some of the modifiable uh, risk factors. And so um, baseline frequency, baseline allodynia are um, mitigators against remission. And so those data just are what the data are, but I would focus on those um, uh, modifiable risk factors in terms of treatment. So um, Stuart, I think you're gonna talk a little bit about the preventive uh, treatment landscape uh, and what things look like. Um, but just before you do that, I wanted to mention that in terms of patients taking the medication that we have right now, they just don't do a great job of taking it. We don't do a great job of helping them to be adherent. It looks like only about one out of six people um, uh, continues the treatment for over one year. And the main reason is they have side effects and it doesn't work. So clearly um, there's a great headache burden, but we need people to take the medications and the medications we're offering them right now uh, in terms of, of, of pre-CGRP therapies, just not a, that effective and people don't stay on it. So with these mechanisms in mind um, of how migraines occur, let's hear from a patient vignette of what it's like to experience um, not only the, the pain of migraine and disability of it, but also the frustration of treatments that don't work. And then uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Tepper as he explains how the monoclonal antibodies might cut through some of that frustration and offer efficacious treatment for patients. Hi, I'm Laura, and I really, really need some help with my headaches. I've always had a battle with headaches, or at least after I started my periods. When I was a teenager, I had these really difficult headaches that would begin about a day before I started to flow, like clockwork. So extra, right? Well, I learned to cope with those using naproxen over the counter, and things gradually got better as I got older. In my 20s, I was diagnosed with major depression plus anxiety. This began with postpartum mood stuff after my second baby. The OBGYN put me on sertraline for that, and it's worked pretty well. I mean, I'm still on it, but I don't have to do therapy anymore. The problem now is that my headaches have just gotten out of control. I mean, like crazy. At least once a week, I have a headache that lasts two to three days. It comes out of the blue, and it's just this intense throbbing. I get sick to my stomach. I have to go lie down in a dark room and keep things as quiet as possible. I know, totally impossible with a toddler and an eight-year-old. I take a tablet with aspirin, acetaminophen, and caffeine in it anywhere from two to six times a day. My OBGYN recommended those. And overall, I probably need those about half the days in the month, but it's escalating, like big time. My primary nurse practitioner started me on amitriptyline, but that just made me feel super tired in the morning, and I couldn't take care of my kids. I then tried propranolol, but that made me dizzy every time I stood up. We then switched to topiramate, but that made me feel bad, and the nurse practitioner said it was messing with my blood work somehow. I'm really scared, and not just because of the pain, but I'm losing the ability to take care of my kids properly, I feel like a complete failure as a mom. I've been missing a lot of work and HR says if I don't do something fast, I'm gonna have to apply for disability. That seems totally wrong. I mean, I'm in my 30s, not my 60s. You're kind of my last hope here. I've just about lost my mind thinking about how I need to get better soon. I was really hoping for something I can just take every now and then that would help me. I'd even be willing to take a shot if I need to. Well, thank you. As, as Dr. Jackson said, we have a number of new types of medicines that target CGRP, and CGRP is integral to the genesis of migraine pain. And he showed you on the cartoon that G-pants are CGRP receptor antagonists, small molecules, two of which have been approved for acute treatment. But 
a patient could take a GPAN every day or every other day and actually prevent migraine. And this was first seen in a study on Remegipant, which is approved in the US for acute treatment of migraine in a 75 milligram dose. It turned out in the open label trials, the more that patients took Remegipant on an acute basis for their migraine, the less migraines they had. And there was a gradual reduction in migraine. And currently, Remegipan is before the FDA for the indication of preventive treatment of migraine in an every other day dosage. It has a fairly long half-life and that allows for the every other day dosage and it blocks the CGRP receptor in a very specific way. Another GPANT that's been developed for uh, prevention is a Togepant. There had been a previous one which was liver toxic called Telcagepant. A Togepant uh, was published um, in a phase two, three trial for prevention of episodic migraine uh, late in 2020. And it showed a magnitude of benefit in terms of dropping the episodic migraine days from baseline that was quite similar to the available drugs that I'm going to talk about, which have really changed everything, the monoclonal antibodies. So I'm just beginning it with a teaser to show the future which would be to um, target CGRP with oral drugs. But what we have now and what's made the huge difference has been monoclonal antibodies. And I, I, I want to lay out how these monoclonal antibodies have affected migraine and what differentiates them from the previous treatments that were so modestly effective and poorly tolerated and poorly adhered to. And we're gonna go through what we know about these, and then Dr. Jackson's going to finish up in rather interesting comparison, which I think shows that the monoclonal antibodies are superior to the previous studies and really represent a new way forward. Uh, the reason the monoclonal antibodies were, were developed was because the early GPANs were liver toxic. The current ones do not appear to be so. Monoclonal antibodies are large molecules. They don't pass into the brain and they don't get met metabolized by the liver. They're removed by the reticuloendothelial system. They work peripherally in the meninges to prevent the migraine pathophysiology, the migraine pain. And they're very large, as I said. So if you look at a G pant on the left and a CGRP monoclonal antibody on the right, it's like the difference between a truck and a grain of rice. And you see over on the right, Dr. Sen Shu, who was the scientist who developed Arenimab. There are now four injectable monoclonal antibodies approved uh, in the US, and these are targeting CGRP or its receptor. Each of them has a four-letter four nonsense suffix which the FDA uh, affixed to them so that we can distinguish them later from biosimilars that will be developed. But the four are arenimab, tremonezumab, galconezumab, and eptonezumab. And arenimab is the monoclonal antibody that targets the CGRP receptor itself and only the receptor. It's monthly, sub-Q, uh, patients injected at home with a 70 or 140 milligram dose. The other three target the CGRP ligand itself. And uh, fremonezumab is the only one that's available in a monthly or quarterly subcutaneous injection. So patients either inject 225 milligrams monthly or 675 milligrams quarterly. Galconezumab uh, is um, started with a 240 milligram loading dose and then it's 120 milligrams sub-Q monthly thereafter. Uh, it's also uh, FDA approved for prevention of episodic cluster headache with a different dose. Eptonezumab is the only one that's intravenous and that is approved in a 100 or 300 milligram intravenous quarterly dose. Arenimab is only available with an auto injector. Fremonezumab with both an auto injector and a pre-filled syringe. Galconezumab with an auto injector or pre-filled syringe. And eptonezumab is just infused. And I'll show you pictures or we will show you pictures of those later. So remember, arenimab on the left is just to the receptor. The other three are for the ligand. 
Here they are, uh, arenumab on the upper left, and you can see the picture of the antibody actually tucking into the receptor to block it. Uh, that's arenumab. The other three, you see the antibodies um, uh, targeting the spherical CGRP and fremenezumab, remember, monthly or quarterly, galcanezumab monthly, and eptinezumab intravenous quarterly, while arenumab is subcutaneous monthly. Here's a cartoon of arenumab in action. You can see the circulating CGRP in the little pink um, uh, at the top, and then on the left, the CGRP tucks into the CGRP receptor to activate it. And on the right, arenumab, which blocks and targets that receptor and prevents the CGRP from binding. And for the sake of simplicity, I didn't show you the other three, which would be the same size as arenumab, but which would be actually attaching to the individual CGRP ligands, to the circulating CGRP. And one other point, the arenumab here is actually shrunk in size and the actual molecules for all of the four monoclonal antibodies would be off the scale of the cartoon. That is how big they are. I think we have three major questions on these new medications. Are they safe? Are they different than our old preventive medications? And are they an improvement? And it's always best to begin with safety. I put together the side effects of the four and the most common side effects of the first three, the self-injection ones, uh, would be injection site reactions. And these are usually uh, reddening or itching or localized hives. They're usually of no consequence. Uh, eptinezumab doesn't have an injection site reaction because it's an infusion. Constipation has been seen with all of them. There's a special warning in the US arenumab prescribing information for it, but it's noted uh, for galcanezumab in the European Union prescribing information. And it really can happen with the three self-injected. We don't know yet about eptinezumab. And I've personally seen uh, constipation with all three. So I warn patients about that prospect. It's usually mild to moderate, it's usually transient, it's usually not a reason that they discontinue. Remember that these do not go through the liver. Uh, they go through the reticuloendothelial system, so they don't have liver abnormalities. And the respiratory symptoms are like sniffles and are not with each product and not in excess of placebo with each study. So it's difficult to know whether they were something transient that were not actually related to the medications. Uh, there is a warning in the U.S prescribing information on, um, for arenumab on hypertension. This is based on the FAERS database of the FDA. So that's unvetted data. And we really don't know whether this is of consequence or not. And in talking with headache colleagues, none of them have seen significant hypertension with monoclonal antibodies. So it's, it's on the back burner and we'll keep an eye on it. With new medications, we need to be vigilant. Uh, there have been no cardiovascular signals of consequence from anywhere from one to five year open label trials with these monoclonal antibodies, which has been very hopeful. And I want to show you a very remarkable study, because one of the questions that's always raised about these new medications that take out this profound vasodilator, CGRP, is what happens when somebody needs to vasodilate? What happens in the setting of angina or the setting of a TIA when somebody has to vasodilate? This remarkable study was published a couple of years ago, and it was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of 88 patients who had documented vascular disease. And these patients had had MIs, they'd had strokes, they'd had documented TIAs. To be eligible for the study, they had to have angina every month for the previous six months due to documented coronary artery disease. Then they were put through an exercise tolerance test and they had to last on the ETT for at least uh, four to 12 minutes. And they had to develop ischemia on the exercise tolerance test manifested by angina plus EKG changes or even more severe EKG changes. If they qualified on that stress test, uh, uh, six weeks later, they were brought back for a second stress test. 
And again, they had to precipitate angina on the stress test and they had the last on the stress test. And the second exercise tolerance test had to match the first one. And then another six weeks later, they were brought back in and randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either a, an intravenous placebo or intravenous arenimab. Remember that arenimab is only available uh, in the US in a subcutaneous form. And by giving it intravenously, it was felt that the CGRP biology would be shut down immediately. And then they were put on the stress test again on the treadmill. And the idea was if they needed the CGRP, they, there might be some signals on the, on the treadmill that would be different once that CGRP biology was shut down. But there were no changes from baseline and exercise duration. There was no time, no difference in the time to onset of the ST segment depressions. There was no difference in the time to onset of the exercise induced angina. And so there were, since there were no infarctions and no evidence for failure of compensatory mechanisms, this was a very reassuring study and suggested that vasodilation is a redundant system and that there are a lot of ways to uh, get to vasodilation. And even in the setting of pretty significantly sick vasculopathic patients, uh, arenimab did not make the angina worse. We do need to maintain our clinical vigilance, but this was a very, very hopeful study. So let's move on to efficacy in terms of the phase three primary endpoints. I think it's useful to look at the drop from baseline for these studies rather than just placebo subtracted data. Patients don't get placebo and Dr. Jackson will show you a way of taking into account placebo and evaluating these medications. But for, for clinical purposes, I think the, the utility of the drop in monthly mean migraine days, the mean monthly migraine days each month, looking at the baseline and looking at the drop is the way that one gets a feel for these medications and one can explain to patients. And if one looks here in episodic migraine studies, the regulatory trials, the average number of migraine days at baseline was about six to eight per month. And the drop from baseline was three to almost five days per month. So about a 50% drop from baseline uh, a, a pretty similar for the two doses of arenimab, um, 120 milligrams of Galka is the only dose that's available. Similar for fremenizumab, both monthly and quarterly, and a little bit numerically better for the 300 milligram eptinezumab. But what's interesting is how similar they are. They all drop the mean monthly migraine days by three months uh, to uh, by about 50%. In the case of arenimab and galcanizumab, that's actually been done in a randomized control trial out to six months. And in the case of eptinezumab, out to 12 months. And I'm going to show you some of those data in a bit. On the chronic migraine side, the patient's baseline was 16 to 18 mean monthly migraine days. And again, there was a drop of uh, between four and almost seven uh, monthly migraine days, depending on which um, medication one looks at. Recently, the eptinezumab data were published. It looks very similar to these. And again, the, the, uh, the monoclonals look quite similar. So very significant drops in mean monthly migraine days by three months in chronic migraine patients who are more afflicted than in our um, episodic migraine patients. And about half of the patients in the chronic migraine studies had medication overuse headache, had acute medication overuse. So uh, the kinds of patients that we would see. Very, very hopeful studies and very similar between uh, all of the monoclonal antibodies. Well, are they an improvement? To uh, look at uh, whether they're an improvement over our previous treatments, it's very useful to look at secondary endpoints. And I'm gonna actually take some of these and go into greater detail. But responder rates, that is the percentage of patients who have at least a 50% or at least a 75% drop in mean monthly migraine days are really at a level that is unprecedented with the um, uh, monoclonal antibodies compared to the previous medications from 41 to 54% had at least a 75% drop in mean monthly migraine days by a year. They are effective with comorbid illnesses such as depression and anxiety. 
patient reported outcomes improve, uh, reduce disability and impact and improved satisfaction. And they have very rapid onset of effect and are effective in those who have had multiple previous preventive medications fail, which is our target patient group. They convert the majority of patients from chronic migraine to episodic migraine. So as Dr. Jackson showed from right to left on that uh, slide and from acute medication overuse to non-overuse and the overall risk benefit analysis is significantly in favor of the newer medicines over the older ones. Let's talk about onset of effect just to compare. Um, treatment with arenimab was associated with significant reductions in weekly migraine days compared with placebo as early as week one for both episodic and chronic migraine. So that's very dramatic, fast onset of effect. And it didn't matter whether the patients had episodic or chronic migraine. And all of them have separated from placebo as early as week one in every single regulatory placebo controlled trial. Um, here is the chronic migraine study on the right and the episodic migraine study on the left. And you see across six months or three months of uh, usage, first there is a drop that's very evident in the first month. And then there continues to be a drop across three months or six months, depending on the study. And this brings to, to um, the four, how long should you try it for patients? And I'm gonna show you multiple pieces of evidence that suggest to me that there is a cumulative benefit across many, many, many months. And if patients do not have side effects, I generally recommend that they try it for six to eight months before giving up because there just is a continuous rolling benefit, even though the onset is so quick. Uh, here's with fremonezumab, and you can see with high frequency episodic migraine, those with eight to 14 headache days per month who had not quite crossed into chronic migraine. Again, the drug worked within the first week of therapy. Uh, here on the, on the right is chronic migraine. And so they've already gone beyond 15 headache days per month. And again, in the, the um, fremonizumab is effective within the first week of treatment compared to placebo. And you can see it on, uh, that that persists across three months with some improvement, actually a little bit higher in the quarterly dosing. So separating from placebo in the first week, significant benefits within the first month, improvement across time. Here's galcanezumab to show you the same thing on the left, the Evolve study, which was episodic migraine. I always remember that because E is for episodic. And you can see the difference uh, in uh, the drop in, um, in uh, response by the first month, which continues across six months for chronic migraine on the left, week one, separating from placebo. So very, very dramatic onset. And again, this early onset is true in, for, both, for both studies in episodic migraine as well as for chronic migraine. And, if, and you can see it week by week. Number one, it kicks in in the first week. Number two, it continues to improve across time for galcanezumab. And then significant reductions in migraine headache days through all weeks of every month across six months for the episodic migraine trials and uh, across three months for the chronic migraine trials for galcanezumab. And again, I would say that what you see is that for each of these monoclonal antibodies, these very dramatic early onset, um, the, the dramatic early onset is followed by continued improvement across time. One of the remarkable uh, pieces of, of evidence for the speed of onset comes with the intravenous eptinezumab trials, where there was actually a prospectively uh, agreed upon uh, outcome measure to evaluate what the likelihood was of a migraine within 24 hours of giving the intravenous eptinezumab. And what they did in these studies was to uh, calculate the likelihood of a migraine on any given day in the baseline period, and then give the drug versus placebo, and then look at what the likelihood was for a migraine uh, in that first 24 hours. 
And for both episodic and chronic migraine, the likelihood of a migraine in that first 24 hours after treatment was reduced by over 50%, a greater, a, a, at least a 50% drop in the likelihood of a migraine within one day of the administration of intravenous eptinezumab. And we've never seen anything like that in treatment of migraine. It shows the target is correct. What about the patients for whom we are most likely to use the medicine? Those who have been given multiple previous preventive medication categories and those medicines have not worked. Well, because of regulatory requirements in Europe, all three com companies decided to do prospective trials, randomized controlled, placebo controlled trials in patients who had at least two to four previous preventive medications fail, usually by category. And the good news was that in all three trials, the monoclonal antibodies worked extremely well and almost as well as they did in the patients who had uh, fewer preventive medications fail them. Uh, on the left, you see the arenimab trial, which was done with 140 milligrams of arenimab compared to placebo. Episodic migraine patients looking at the 50% responder rates. On the right, Fremenezumab monthly is in red and quarterly is in blue. And they uh, for the Fremenezumab trial, they studied patients who had both episodic or chronic migraine uh, and who had had a lack of success with at least two to four previous medication categories. And again, you see very dramatic benefits to the Fremenezumab, even though these should be more difficult to treat patients. And then finally, galcanezumab uh, in what was called the CONQUER study that was published in late 2020, superior to placebo in patients with two to four preventive medication categories. Again, they prospectively gathered patients who had episodic migraine and chronic migraine. And again, they were uh, interested in those who had had uh, multiple medication category failures. And again, the responder rates look great. For example, if you look at the 50% responder rates at the end of this three-month trial, uh, a third of the patients had at least a 50% drop in their migraine days who had chronic migraine, over 40% in episodic migraine, and close to 9% in chronic migraine, and, close, and uh, over 18% for episodic migraine had at least a 75% drop in their mean monthly migraine days. So we can say to our patients who have had one medication after another fail them that we have treatment that is likely to work for them, which is very encouraging. Now, the um, Italians studied um, galcanezumab in terms of mean monthly migraine days and patient reported outcomes in their chronic migraine patients who had very significant disability at baseline as measured by the headache impact tests and the migraine disability assessment scale. And again, the number of mean monthly migraine days dropped dramatically by three months and the disability and impact for the patients improved across the three months. They studied 81 patients, 70% uh, of them had had a lack of success with at least four previous preventive medicines. And despite all of this, the results were extremely encouraging. Let's talk a little bit about medication overuse headache or rebound or MOH. What these medications, what the monoclonal antibodies do is reverse medication overuse and move patients from chronic migraine to episodic migraine. And one of the problems with our older medications is that they didn't do that. They, if we gave amitriptyline in a patient who was overusing um, combination analgesics or triptans, usually amitriptyline or propranolol or topiramate would not work to get the patients out of medication overuse. And what the monoclonal antibodies do, whether the patient has episodic migraine or chronic migraine, what they do first is they drop the acute medication use, which actually is intuitively, should be intuitively obvious because if they have less headaches, they're going to have less acute medication use. And if the headaches are less severe and less long, they're going to have less acute medication use. 
So here are patients diagnosed with chronic migraine and medication overuse headache and evaluating a thousand patients with eptinezumab in their randomized control trial, 40% uh, of their chronic migraine patients were in medication overuse, acute medication overuse. And you can see the drop in total acute medication overuse and in triptan overuse was, was very significant for both the 100 milligram and the 300 milligram dosage of eptinezumab. So they, these monoclonal antibodies drop the acute med use. And then that leads to a reduction of migraine days. And that the reduction of migraine days can occur whether they're overusing the acute medicine or not. And that's what you want to see. So here's galconazumab, which reduced monthly migraine headache days. And uh, you can see here the patients who used medic who had medication overuse on the left and the patients who did not have medication overuse on the right, the magnitude of benefit for the drop in mean monthly migraine days was actually greater in the rebound patients or the patients who were overusing acute medications. At the very least, you can say that these medications that what can one can do with monoclonal antibodies is give them to patients who are overusing medicines and expect benefit. Now, I do need to caution you that patients who are overusing butalbital and narcotics were excluded in these studies. But what ends up happening is the medication overusers go to non-overuse. The chronic migraine patients go below 15 headache days per month. And you can see that here with arenimab, uh, looking at the patients who had uh, 70 and 100 milligrams of arenimab without acute medication use and with acute medication use in the percentage of patients who converted from chronic migraine to episodic migraine. And on the right, you can see that that worked whether they were overusing simple analgesics or triptans or combination analgesics. And interestingly, onabotulinum toxin A, when it was evaluated for what it did in chronic migraine with medication overuse, it dropped the triptan use, but not the analgesic use. So it's very hopeful that the monoclonal antibodies can actually reverse all of the medication overuse types, although we don't know about opioids or barbiturates. So that changes my practice because what I do is I take patients who have chronic migraine and medication overuse and I put them on the uh, monoclonal antibodies and then I let nature take its course because I, I recognize that over a three to eight month period, the majority of them are going to convert. And that's really changed the way I practice. And the reason I go so long is that the responder rates keep going up across time. This ability to improve responder rates across time is quite unprecedented. And at the top, what one sees is in episodic migraine, the likelihood of patients achieving at least a 75% reduction in their mean monthly migraine days, 75%, which is linked to drop in disability, that keeps going up across time and reaches 44% of patients with at least a 75% reduction by six months. On the bottom, if one looks at 30 days in a row of no headache, that's referred to as a 100% response rate, and they may get a headache the next month, but at least they had 30 days in a row of no migraine, um, over 15% of patients achieve that by the fourth month of treatment. So that's quite a remarkable turn of events and very much uh, greater than we've ever seen with any treatments before. And this responder rate in increase keeps going on across time. Here's with eptinezumab. In their episodic migraine trial, it was placebo controlled for a year. And by the end of a year, over half the patients, 54% of the patients treated with 300 milligrams of intravenous eptinezumab quarterly had at least a 75% reduction in their mean monthly migraine days. Uh, com and that compared obviously statistically significantly to placebo. So how long should we treat before we, before we give up? Well, there are plenty of pieces of evidence now that patients with an initial non-response in month one will have 
will respond in month two or month three or longer. And one can evaluate that with 50% responder rates as was done here in an episodic migraine trial with galcanezumab. This was in the patients who had, had at least two to four previous preventive medicines fail. So even in those who have had the previous medicines fail, over time, the likelihood of response goes up. Here is in the chronic migraine group, again, those who had had uh, two to four medicines uh, types fail. And again, the patients with non-response in month one might respond in month two or three. Uh, and in the chronic migraine patients, they looked at at least a 30% response rate because chronic migraine is more difficult to treat. Here's fremonezumab, and here you really see the benefit of going long-term. And if one looks at the upper left, the chronic migraine uh, studies, first in the double-blind placebo-controlled trial, then in the long-term trial, looking at the 50% response rate, by nine months, almost half the patients had at least a 50% drop in their mean monthly migraine days. And you can see the difference going even from month six to month nine. On the right is episodic migraine. Again, you see this cumulative benefit in the improvement in responder rates going from month one to month nine or even from month six to month nine. So sticking with it can really help patients. Uh, and eptinezumab, again, uh, you can see how the responder rates gradually creep up week by week and month by month. And arenumab, uh, in patients who achieved at least a 50% response at least once during the study, that goes up over month one, month two, month three. And the likelihood of that improvement is higher with the 140 milligram arenumab numerically than the 70. And the advice that I give based on this study is that if a patient is a non-responder at one month to 70, you should switch them to 140 immediately. If they're a non-responder with 140 in the first month of arenumab, just stay with it because they are more likely than not to develop uh, responders, uh, response rates that are excellent over time. So again, I would, I would stick with it six to eight months at least for patients uh, who are likely to be more difficult than were included in the original studies, as long as they don't have side effects. Now, what we really want to get to is, is there a way to evaluate whether these monoclonal antibodies are really superior to previous migraine preventive medicines? And this needs to take into account both efficacy and adverse events and placebo responses. And before I turn this over to Dr. Jackson to to explain how you might evaluate the monoclonal antibodies versus the previous older preventive treatments, it might actually be worthwhile returning to our patient and seeing how she's done. So this cool auto injector thingy is working really well for me. I appreciate your nurse taking the time to show me how to do it. Injecting myself in the office the first time allowed me to have the confidence that I could do it on my own. I can't believe the difference. I mean, for the past six months, it's just been a game changer. I could tell in the first month that the headaches were less frequent and less intense. They also didn't last as long. I'm down to headaches now that last less than a whole day. Sometimes they're mild enough that acetaminophen alone will work for me. And I usually don't have to take those more than two to three days per month. I haven't had to take sumatriptan for rescue in months. Last month, my boyfriend and I had a celebration dinner when I was able to mark off 30 straight days without a headache. Of course, two Pinot Noirs meant that I had a headache the next day. Lesson learned, right? The treatment's like way easy. I just auto inject in each thigh and in my belly and gets a little red for a day or so afterwards, but nothing too bad. I can't believe I only have to do it four times a year. I feel like I have my life back. I'm a good mom again, I'm a fun girlfriend, and I go days without thinking about headaches. Migraines aren't running my life anymore. I am. So thanks a lot, Dr. Tepper. Um, as you said, studies are different. And so 
when we learn to compare apples to apples, oranges to oranges, it just makes things um, a, a little better. Now, the gold standard is a head-to-head -head study of different therapeutic agents. Um, and in the absence of that gold standard, what statisticians have developed in terms of epidemiology in, is how to compare studies by something called the number needed to treat or the number needed uh, to harm. And so the number needed to treat is how many patients you need to expose to a given therapy uh, in order to expect a change uh, in the positive direction. Number needed to harm takes into account adverse events or, or so-called side effects. And uh, the number needed to harm uh, obviously is how many patients need to be exposed to the given therapy in order to uh, have a patient experience that particular adverse event. And so there are a number of different ways um, uh, that we could go through how these uh, NNT or NNH are derived. I would advise you to uh, take a look at them because they'll probably on your, be on your board certification exams. They generally always are. Now, um, if you look at number needed to treat and number needed to harm, that's sort of um, uh, a way that we can compare cross studies, as we said. And then also, you want that to be uh, you want that to be different. You want the number needed to treat to be low, and you want the number needed to treat, you know, excuse me, in the nature, number needed to harm to be high. And that kind of gets to the idea of the therapeutic window or therapeutic index in terms of um, a, a, a therapy being efficacious uh, without being harmful. So let's look at the number needed to harm, number needed to treat data uh, from migraine prevention RCTs. And then um, if you look across uh, the monoclonal antibodies, um, uh, the, the, the first three that you see there, um, the number needed to treat, you see single digits, uh, which is excellent. Um, anytime we see a single digit number needed to treat, that's generally considered, considered to be an efficacious uh, treatment. Um, again, looking through the EVOLVE study, you see single digit uh, number needed uh, to treat or numbers needed to treat an episodic migraine. Um, and you see that um, across the board. Looking at topiramate and propanolol, again, uh, mostly single digit numbers uh, that are needed to treat. Where um, we do see uh, things start to separate is in the number uh, needed to harm. And you see some very large in an H's or numbers needed to harm in the monoclonal antibody studies. And indeed, a thousand or over in some of the studies, um, as opposed to, um, let's say, uh, to pyramid or propanolol, you may see um, a single digit number needed to harm. And so what, what that means is when you see the number needed to treat, number needed to harm being essentially the same order of magnitude, then what you're seeing is that uh, you can expect that as many patients will have an adverse event as would have a positive outcome from the study. And that's not what we see with the MABs or the monoclonal antibodies. What we see with those is that we have uh, low numbers needed to treat. And that means that the, the, the medication is effective. And yet we see very large numbers needed to harm, which means that uh, in effect, um, that, that, that um, the therapeutic window is, is, is quite large, it's quite open. It means that we don't expect patients to have adverse events. So if the drug works and people don't have adverse events, we would expect patients to be quite adherent to therapy and to therefore um, uh, get positive effects out of continued therapy. So let's talk about who should receive the new preventive treatments. Obviously, these medications, because they're monoclonal antibodies, can be expensive if we're talking about just simply drug acquisition costs as opposed to a generic medication that's been on the market for, for decades, uh, for instance. However, if we're looking at disability reduction, obviously there are other uh, downstream effects where the total cost of uh, treatment may actually be low if you can drive that disability down uh, and can get patients, as, as Stuart said, back to the leftward mode, whether in episodic or, or low numbers of, of headache days rather than chronic migraine, 15 days or more. So, um, it, it, we think that uh, that these drugs, if we're looking at the American Headache Society consensus statement, it should be available to be prescribed by anybody who's licensed in healthcare uh, clinician to patients who meet the following criteria. If they if they got lower frequency episodic migraines, so that's four to seven headache days a month, then two failed trials of preventive agents, and you see uh, the sort of anti-epileptic or membrane modulator class, TCA class, 
uh, beta blockers, SNRIs, or other level A or level B uh, preventatives. So they've failed too, but then they've also documented uh, at least moderate disability or impact uh, by the migraines. Now, high frequency, uh, episodic, and chronic migraine, it's the same um, requirements as, as the low frequency, but you don't have to document disability because if they got uh, eight or more days a month, then the disability is there uh, by definition. So in the chronic migraine patients, um, same requirements, but if they've used onobotulinum toxin A um, as an additional choice, uh, that would count also as, as a failed therapy. So if we look at the number of recommended meds uh, for preventive treatment of migraine that were seen in the OVERCOME study, uh, what you see is of responders, a minority of them had used preventive agents before, um, but there were a significant number that had used two or more preventative agents. And um, you see the, the migraine headache days, and as you would expect, those who had higher migraine days to so the chronics, uh, to the far right, where though a larger percentage of those patients had used um, one or more preventative medications in the past. And if you look at um, this, these data sort of different way, um, those who sought care, um, large percentage, those who sought care were diagnosed, smaller percentage, and then those who sought care diagnosed and actually took recommended preventive medication uh, was only one out of six. And so un unfortunately, um, this sort of parallels some other chronic diseases that we see sometimes in my area of primary care. I, I was thinking is, is Dr. Turbo was speaking about um, the, the migraineurs, was thinking about major depressive disorder and how we often see it in our practices, but unfortunately, a minority of patients actually get diagnosed and get on proper or recommended therapy. The tremendous difference in those two illnesses, as I see it from a primary care perspective, is that um, if you're talking about people that have failed two agents, um, the efficacy that we're seeing out of the monoclonal antibodies for migraines is just not seen in treatment for distant depression. If they fail two agents in, in major depression disorder, it's quite difficult to get them to remission. And so uh, these are very encouraging findings that we see uh, in these studies of patients who could be tough to treat uh, because they've already failed two preventive agents, but you're seeing efficacy out of the, the monoclonal antibodies. So to kind of sum up, we've talked about CGRP tonight um, as um, a sort of a, a central player in the basalgenic inflammatory milieu that attends uh, migraineur's clinical symptomatology. Um, if you think about CGRP kind of an analogy of being oxygen to a fire, if you take oxygen away from a fire, obviously the flame dies out. If you take CGRP away from uh, a migraine uh, episode, then the thought is that that migraine episode will be mitigated. And so uh, the monoclonal antibodies are effective. They're approved for all migraines, uh, episodic and chronic, with and without aura, with and without uh, medication overuse, and in Stewart's presentations of the different studies, I think you can see that there's a reason why they're approved. Efficacy is across the board. The breadth and depth of efficacy is there. So how do we give them? Well, with um, arinumab and with galconezumab, it's a self-injection monthly. Um, with premonizumab, you see there's a self-injection. You can either do that monthly or every three months. And then eptinezumab, there's an IV infusion that occurs um, every three months. And some of the monoclonal antibodies have an auto injector. Some are available with auto injector and uh, self or a, a self administered um, uh, syringe. So, to conclude, CGRP is pivotal in migraine pathophys. Um, and translational research links CGRP uh, to multiple anti migraine treatments, including uh, the preventative monoclonal antibodies that we've discussed uh, today. The MABs of the monoclonal antibodies are superior to previous migraine preventive medications, if you take into account uh, both their remarkable efficacy, their rapid onset, uh, sort of their climbing uh, response rates over time, their maintenance of effect, um, uh, uh, a paucity of an adverse event profile, uh, and, and their robust efficacy, even in patients that have failed two uh, previous um, uh, preventative uh, attempts. So the AHS Consensus statement of January 2019 provides guidance for us in terms of selecting patients. And basically, it comes down to uh, if, they've, if they've got uh, four to seven uh, headache days, then, then as long as you document disability and two uh, failures of preventive agents, then uh, it's recommended uh, that payers provide for this type of treatment. Um, if they're in that um, 
episodic migraine cate category of eight headache days, or if they're in a chronic uh, migraine category of 15 days or more per month, then um, the disability is, is considered um, de rigueur and it would be expected if they failed two treatments uh, to be included in um, step therapy and so that they could uh, receive access to the monoclonal antibodies. And so that's quite exciting uh, what these treatments can offer our migraine patients. And so we hope that you'll have every success in offering your patients um, increased hopefulness for um, mitigating their symptoms or even affecting a cure. So we're going to end with a quote from David Dodek. He's the chair of the American Brain Foundation. And uh, speaking of migraines, David said, I see a day when, when, within our careers when uh, it will not be acceptable to treat patients by having them cycle through this ragtag group of drugs that over 80% will stop within a year just to get to disease-specific and mechanism-based treatments that were specifically designed to treat this disease. And I couldn't agree with David more. You know, uh, if we have translational research that points directly to this molecule, CGRP, that's intimately associated with migraine pathophysiology, why not use targeted therapy uh, to treat patients properly from the beginning? So we wish you every success in treating your patients uh, as you move forward and use these monoclonal antibodies for the, the patients that will benefit so much. Thank you.